Scott Lee, alcoholic. Hi, you guys. Let's, uh, let's open with a few moments of silence and invite God to the meeting. Amen. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Um, I've got a real good memory, but it's kind of short. And uh, I didn't cover a couple of things on the meditation. One of them is I need to give credit where credit's due. The bus ride is a gift from Miss Linda. We came out of meditation one time, and she said, I've got a new one, and she took me on the bus ride. The stones in the stream are actually hers also. She came out of meditation one time and said, I've got a new one. And on hers, it was the bus ride and the trip into the woods. Instead of the stream, you come to a clearing, and it's rained. And the base of the rainbow is at the far side of the clearing. You walk up to it, there's a door. You walk in, you go up the stairs and sit in the arch of the rainbow. And then the colors are what I laid out for you. And I thought, that's too beautiful, so I put the stones in the stream. And I was doing, uh, I was doing this in a treatment center, and one of the guys said he picked up a couple of stones. And so I just want to let you know where those things came from. And uh, for those who are wondering, from the time I asked you to close your eyes until I said open them when you're ready, it was 14 minutes. Some will think it was a lot longer. Some will think it was a lot shorter. Meditation seems to warp time. And I'm wondering, just as a show of hands, who picked up a stone? Who picked up stones? Just a couple. Okay. Just always kind of curious about that. Um, turn it over to John to get started on step 12. There were stones? <laughs> Welcome back, John. How many people fell asleep? Well, none, and I'm really disappointed. Because I, I did this at a, a, a men's retreat that John started a few years ago. They called it Step Brothers. Pretty fabulous name for a men's retreat. And I did it there, and one of the guys just was carving out some snores. And I, and I had lived, and I said, God, please help us send love to those in this, this room who've gotten into extremely deep meditation. And everybody just roared. Of course, he, that brought him up, but that was the end of that meditation. I've been waiting. I haven't been able to use it since then. That's, what, what three years ago? Oh, yeah. Hasn't happened since. I'm really disappointed because I'm ready for that one. Thanks, Scott, for sharing that with us. Uh, John Alcoholic. John. This 12th step of having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to other alcoholics. I um, you know, This is a long chapter. I'm not going to begin to get into it and, 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 and read that to you. Um, I want to share with you some experiences. Hopefully I can touch on all three parts of those. Um, the first time I was asked to lead a 12th step, being just, you know, our, our local group um, this guy asked me to lead on the 12th step and I and I went on to tell a story that I'm going to tell in a second and I said you know um, I said my first experience with uh, the 12th step is a 12 step call and I went on to talk about this 12 step call and I thought it was a you know pretty interesting story and um, when I got in the car with my sponsor I said um, he kind of had this grin on his face and not grin but scowl and I said you know what did you think of the meeting and he said that was terrible. And I said, uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, um, your first experience with the 12-step is as a recipient. Don't ever forget that. And, um, <laughs> it just has always stuck with me, and I've always shared it. You know, it's, it's the kindness of strangers that I owe my life to. Right? I mean, there's, that's a stolen sentence from a friend of ours, Joe, but there's no true effect. Right? I mean, if at night in night school in November of 1988, I'm sitting in that room dying and some guy says hey let's go to a meeting you know, if he doesn't reach out his hand that day you probably have a different speaker you know I um, while that step does kind of um, say okay after we've had this spiritual waking then we then we go try to carry this message and um, you know that doesn't mean that we can't be of service and can't do 12 step work and you know before we get to the 12 step you know so many guys I talk to uh, say you know I you know i I'm not ready to sponsor. I haven't, you know, I have, I've only been sober X amount of time or I'm not ready or I've been sober long enough. And that's just such nonsense. You may not be completely ready to take a guy completely through the steps, but that's what your sponsor's for, to guide you the rest of the way. You know, what happens if Ebby says, well, I've only got 60 days. I'm not ready to go talk to that guy, Bill, yet. Right? 60 days. What happens if Bob says, I mean, if Bill says, I'm not ready to go see Bob yet. I've only got, you know, Six months. Might not be sitting here, you know. 
and frankly, I I I, I, I spend a lot of time um, in institutions. I I love carrying a message uh, into prisons and jails and treatment centers. And um, there's one particular treatment center um, I was in was a, a juvenile facility, and you know, frankly, they when I would bring somebody with 90 days or six months or something to tell their story, they were much more interested hearing from them than they hearing from me. You know, at this point, I'm some old guy, you know, with 20-something years of sobriety, and they just think that's nonsense, you know. So don't ever sell yourself short that you're not, you're not ready to do this. And whatever, your, whatever experience you don't have, someone else has it. You know, that's, that's the beauty of sponsorship. I guess I'm going to, you know, jump all around the, the, this conversation. But my, my very first 12-step call, um, I, I had this sponsor. He was kind of like the 12-step guru of our, our, of our a clubhouse and back then you know the the modern day 12-step call has changed you know back 30 years ago 35 years ago you know the phone rang regularly and you know a bunch of us would gather up and hop in the car and go pick up a wet drunk or a close to wet drunk or whatever it was and, and try our best to 12-step them and try to get them into Alcoholics Anonymous and carry the message what we do and you know my sponsor never whenever the we'd have a phone in our clubhouse whenever the phone would ring and a 12 step call you know I never got asked to to go and finally um you know cuz I as the book says you know you can't transmit something you haven't got but um this one day the phone rang and and um this guy wanted to go to detox and wanted some help and my sponsor looked around and it was just me and this guy Rick and I said, well you guys are it you know and uh, we went and picked up this guy and my sponsor gave me two bucks to buy him a bottle because he said he was shaky and um, I took that money and I bought a pack of cigarettes and um, I went over to my father's house and stole a bottle of tequila and we gave Bobkin, his, that was the guy's name, Bobkin, this bottle of tequila. It seemed like a good allocation of resources and um, before we got halfway we were going down to DC General Detox which is, is no longer there and about a 45 minute drive and before we got five minutes into it, the whole bottle of tequila was gone and by the time we got down to the hospital, he was done. I mean, completely just dead to the world, passed out in the back seat. And part of the deal at that detox, I'm sure it's most places, that, you know, you, the patient has to be willing to say, yeah, I want to stay here. I need some help. You know, they need to, you know, uh, agree. And by the time we got down there, he couldn't even speak. You know, we could not get him to do anything. And so we spent a number of hours getting him to kind of come to. And finally, we got him into this, this thing. And you know, we were driving home from this 12-step call, and I was just, I mean, walking on cloud nine. I was, I was glowing as we, I can still, I know exactly where we were. We were driving along Canal Road, which goes along Potomac River up out of D.C. into Montgomery County. And in my head, I'm writing my story for the next edition of the big book. I mean, I just, I know this is a magical, I mean, this is my first 12-step call. I mean, of course, no one else has had this experience. I can't wait to get to my group tomorrow and tell everybody about it, because, you know, they've never had this experience. And um, I rushed to get to my group the next day, and I walk into my group, and, and there's the guy that we took to the heat docs last night, stone cold drunk, just pissing his pants, doing what we do. And I lost my mind. I mean, I was crazy. I mean, I didn't you know, say anything at the time, but I was like, God, you know, wasted my whole night. And all of a sudden, I, finally, my sponsor after me is like, what, what is wrong with you? What? I said, man, I spent all night. I gave him that good bottle of tequila, and, you know, son of a bitch is, you know, here at the meeting. And he said, dummy, you stayed sober. Right? <laughs> dummy, you stayed sober. And that was the truth. You know, my job is to try to carry this message. I, um, you know, in talking about how the 12-step calls have changed, you know, I would, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would venture to say that most of the people in this room have not been on a wet 12-step call. You know, it, it has changed, and so we have to change as a society and as a group. So we don't have that luxury, but we have to work with others, Right? We have to, and, we, and the book says both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress, something like that. Right, so if this is a must, this is something I have to do, not just you know, help the, the old guy along, but I've got to work with a new guy. If my life is ever too busy that I'm not working with a new guy, something else has to be cut out. And that's just a must for me. And so the modern-day 12-step call is in the institutions. It's in the you know, treatment centers, prisons, wherever it is. I mean, they're doing us a favor. They're rounding up all the drunks for us and putting them in the spot. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, so if, you, if, if, if something's missing in your recovery and you feel like, man, I'm just, you know, I'm a year, two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years sober, and I'm at a plateau, and I'm just, just not feeling it, find a prison.
knock on their door. My favorite meeting of the week is the prison I go to on Thursday nights. I'm there two or three Thursdays a night. I go to the maximum security prison in Hagerstown. Most of the guys are doing 20 years plus, and I'm just a, I'm just a member of the group. You know, they've got guys in there that are 35 years sober that have found a way to be at peace with their life and, their, and what the rest of their life is going to be in prison. You know, they got something I want. I, you know, I, I go home and cry about, you know, my bank account, you know. And one of the things that I was told to me to, to take with me into a prison, especially, or, or a jail, it, there, there is no separation between me and those guys. You know, I heard when we were at our place, you have to do some training, you know, to get into the prison. And, and I heard one of the other A members say, you know, well, the inmates, I, you know, I almost lost my mind. You know, it, there's, is, as Scott says, in, in our home group, there's, there's two types of convicts in our home group. Those that have been convicted and those that haven't been convicted, right? The only difference between me and these guys in prison is that they, you know, they got convicted. I haven't. I certainly should be in that prison, right, for just as long as they are. I, um, I do a lot of spiritual reading. I try to read as much as I can, and I, and I heard something recently that really changed my life and changed how I work with new guys. This guy said, when I, when I could surrender three things, I became much more useful. He said, if I can surrender the need to be right, mm -hmm. if I can surrender the need to be powerful, and if I can surrender the need to be effective, it'll change my whole life. And man, I, I started just practicing these things, not being very good at just practicing these things. And it has just changed my life. The first one was really easy, that, that need to be right. I learned that, you know, everything I, I've learned the hard way. I'll share with you how I learned that. I, uh, my son recently, uh, uh, recently, a couple years ago, became an Eagle Scout. And uh, part of that deal is you have to do a community service project. You know, you, whatever it is. And his, his was kind of cool. His was he built a, a fire pit and a bench at the local halfway house. But, you know, he waited the last minute a lot like his father and his mom had been nagging him for years to get this done. And there's a, there's a, a deadline. If you don't do it besides, you know, this day before you turn 18, you can't become an Eagle Scout. So he waits the very last minute and he says, hey, um, I've got it scheduled. I've got my plans approved. I'm going to do it this second weekend in November. And this was like the first week of November. And I, and I really had been after him long because I wanted to be a part of it. You know, I wanted to help him. And... Um, and I said, you know, John, uh, that's my annual weekend that I go to a men's retreat with my sponsor and, and a bunch of other men, and that's, that's my big weekend where I go, you know, I can't help you. You know, you can't live your life this way. And I went on to lecture him, like, you know, that's not how the world works. You know, you, you know you're late making plans. The world's not going to change things for you. And he goes, oh, no, I know you're right. You're right. I can't, you know, I don't expect you to stay home. It's fine. Go. And I, and I went on to this retreat, and I'm sitting there, and, you know, I'm with all the men that I love, and I just, you know, I got all choked up, and I'm... I realized I'm in the wrong spot, you know, where I wanted to be is was at home with my son, you know, doing Eagle Scout stuff. And, but I was right, you know, I was right, you know, and that was my emphasis with him, you know, you can't, that's not the way the world works. And I totally robbed myself of a, of a really incredible experience. I am, um, in thinking about practicing these principles in all our affairs, I want to, I don't even know what time we started, but that's okay. I am, um, my life has changed dramatically in so many ways in the last four or five years, but just continuing to seek. We, um, uh, one of the principles that I like to operate by, and I've shared with you, is that um, everything is God's. You know? And um, when my wife and I, about a dozen years ago, decided to rebuild our lives, we were going to go on a different footing, this was the operating principle of our life, that everything is God's. And we opened up our home. I mean, we've always had an AA home where there's lots of AA activities, but you know, we rented, gave the basement out to newcomers, and, you know, we've had AA weddings at our house and bridal showers and baby showers at our house, and her mom died in our house, and you know, the only thing we haven't had in our house is somebody give birth, you know. Maybe that'll happen. Yeah. Um, just hope it's not my wife. Um, <laughs> you know, so that was the principle we were operating on, and, and uh, you know, if you start saying that out loud, God will take you up on it. <laughs> especially if you start saying it out loud in meetings. And I, um, how I learned that lesson was I was, uh, I had this terrible resentment against a girl I work with, and she owed me, um, she worked kind of for
for me, like I wasn't her direct boss, but she, she worked underneath me and she borrowed $500 from me and never paid it back. You know, single mom, two, three kids, and just her whole life, she's 40 something years old, her whole life, she's lived from hand to mouth. Um, you know, one paycheck gets missed and the whole cards come tumbling down. So she borrowed $500 from me and didn't pay it back and didn't say, do what she was going to say she'd do. And by now I'm doing okay, you know, obviously because I could give her 500 bucks. And I'm, I'm just losing my mind about it, you know, because every payday she says I'm going to give you something and she doesn't and hides from me or whatever. And so it's one day I'm just getting ready to blow her up on the text. You know, I just, you know, all caps, you know, from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, just, you know, you are, you know, how dare you, you know. And here's a guy who's, you know, gone bankrupt for, you know, almost a million dollars. And, um, you know, how dare you, you know, you're taking food from my kid's mouth, you know which is not the case. You, you've stolen from me, you know, and, and I, I, that was the last sentence. I said, you've stolen from me and my kids, and I was getting ready to send this text, and I had that small voice, you know, in the back of my head experience that Scott was talking about, and I believe it was the voice of God. I don't believe God, you know, communicates that way directly to us, but whatever it was doesn't really matter, and that voice said, if everything is God, she can't steal from you. And I didn't send the text. And um, so the next day, I, I really wanted to, but I didn't. And I, uh, the next day, um, my boss, my partner sent me to Starbucks to get three Starbucks for me, him and my other partner. And when I got back, um, he had to leave real quick. And so there was nobody to give this pumpkin spice latte to. And I you know, went around the entire office, there were about 50 of us in there. And I asked every single person if they want this pumpkin spice latte besides her. And, uh, you know, because I, I, I want to punish, you know, because I, I, I need to be right. You know, she owes me and she does not deserve this. And, um, you know, long story short, I, I ended up giving that pumpkin spice latte. And a, a little while later, we, we started this new business and, and we started under the principle that we were going to do what was right for the customer, no matter what, regardless of profit. That's easy to say. It's really hard to do. I mean, really hard to do. And this, this business serves family in the time of needs when they, when they have a death in the family. And, um, and we just, as a group, we fell in love with serving each other and, and, and serving the people that needed our services. And this business just took off astronomically, just overnight. You know, it was done incredibly well, you know. And um, just last month, uh, or last summer, this last summer that passed, that same girl that I was telling you about that I, you know, could not stand, that I had just terrible resentment for, we bought her a brand new car and gave it to her, no strings attached. You know, it wasn't a Mercedes, but it was, you know, she didn't, I'm saying she didn't have to pay for it. It was a company car. We gave her a company car. And that's the transformation of what happens in here when we just try to do the next right thing and try to follow these principles and make these amends, you know. And, and she has become... Um, she's become our best employee, you know, and, um, and not that we, we, we bribed her to do it, but, but that's my instinct is to, is to punish someone who has offended me, you know, but when I do the exact opposite and love them, remarkable things happen, you know, because that's, that's what I want. I was at this um, uh, restaurant earlier this year. My, my partner and I go to this fancy restaurant once a week for lunch, well, twice a week, but, and, um, you know, it's pretty expensive and, uh, you know, 70, 80 bucks for lunch and, we're sitting at the bar, and um, this waitress is just terrible, just god-awful terrible. And the worst than her being terrible, like the drinks were wrong, the napkins were wrong, no utensils, the meal was wrong, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kind of punish, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm, anyway, but my first instinct was like, oh, you know, I've been trained well, I'm, I got a good sponsor, you know, treat her with some loving kindness, you know, she's having a rough day, and so, okay, you know, and I'm, I'm getting over that. But, we're, but you know, that, that weared off quickly, wore off quickly because she didn't know she was doing it. Like, she didn't care about doing a bad job. And, you know, there was no, like, oh, I'm sorry, everything about your meal has been wrong. You know, it was just kind of like, kind of screw you idiots, you know, is what her attitude was. Fancy to real. And so um, the bill came, and there's no way I'm, I'm leaving a tip. You know, she does not deserve a tip, right? Can I get up? Show of hands, all right? Doesn't deserve anything. And, um, you know, the, the bill was like 70 or 80 bucks. And, um, and I... I tipped her the price of the bill. And he said, what, you know, what in the hell are you doing? And I said, well, I had a quick 
decision. I could either continue, you know, kind of hating her or being angry about it, or I could do the opposite, which was to love her. The only way I could love her in that moment was to, to overtip her. And then this gem fell out of my mouth was that, you know, I said, Tony, my entire life I've been overtipped for bad service. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's how God has treated me. <laughs> I have not gotten what I deserved my entire life. I am. Um, Thank you, John. That God has overtipped me for bad service. I just love that story. Thank you. Uh, step 12 for me is not so much a direction as it is a description of who I will become for having actually done those first 11 steps. So, so what will I look like? Well, I'll be spiritually awakened. And I have something in me that drives me to try to give this message to someone else and to try to practice these principles in all my affairs. So I become two things. I become an apprentice messenger, tried to carry this message. And I become a caddy in the sense of a golf caddy. I still carry all that garbage from my past. But it has no weight or stench. And what makes it light and airy is my willingness for God to use it to touch other lives. And step 12 is who I become. Um, I don't know how to talk about step 12 without running it together with sponsorship because they just kind of weave as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I did want to share an experience I had years ago sitting in a little restaurant having lunch and this, mm. this guy walks up to my table and he, I look up at this guy and he says, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, no, if I should, I apologize, I don't know you. And he said, well, you came into a prison I was in a couple of years ago and you spoke and I heard you and I believed you. I'm doing what you said. I'm never going to be incarcerated again for the rest of my life and I'd like to thank you for my freedom. I want you to have that one. I've had that one more than once. You want to have that one. I, I challenge you. Go to a correctional facility. Go jump through the hoops, whatever you have to do, and go once. If you're going to get hooked on corrections, you'll get hooked your very first trip through the door. I, I had an experience a number of years ago. I've just realized that my team is playing the arch rival on TV tonight, and I have the jail commitment. And I am stomping around the house. Doesn't anybody else ever step up? And I have to be the one that carries the ball. And, and Miss Linda doesn't even respond. Because, see, she knows something I don't know. I'm going. See, I don't know that. She does. <laughs> she knows that. And that's the night I come out of the jail a foot off the ground with tears running down my face, yeah. knowing for a fact that this gentle, laughing God has used a sick guy like me as a tool in his holy hand to touch another life. And one of those guys that I went in to see that night's not going to be an inmate again. You want that experience. You want that one. What a, what a phenomenal experience. Uh, I talk a little bit about sponsorship. by a fellow who eventually sponsored me, I had about 10 years, and I saw him getting his 22-year chip. And he said, when I was new, I didn't want to get a sponsor because I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. And it occurred to me, people telling me what to do all the time. Landlady telling me, get out. Cop telling me, get in. <laughs> Maybe I get one of these sponsors, do what he says. Nobody else can tell me what to do. Been my experience for 22 years. Thank you. And sat down. I thought, yeah, there it is. There it is. Somebody's going to tell me what to do. All my life, they have chosen my teachers. It started in kindergarten. This is your teacher. First grade, 12th grade, college courses, Air Force pilot training. These are your teachers. In this thing here, where I have wagered my life, my sanity, and my freedom, I get to choose my teachers. I've chosen well. You might want to think about that. Choose well. Choose well. Page 89, practical experience, not some wild theory. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. That intensive is kind of an important word, I think. Page 96, I've been talking for a couple of pages about a 12-step call. Somebody said they might have a problem and got a hold of a couple of us, and we went over to his house and talked about our drinking. He talked about his. We laughed. We cried. We left him a book. Paragraph begins in the middle of 96. Suppose you're not making your second visit to a man. So that was the first. Now for me, we describe or define someone who is sponsorable in a single sentence. He has read this volume, says he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps of the program of recovery. So there's the definition of the program again. 
And someone who is responsible has read this book or they've tried. Have you had the experience as your, as your mind moves across the page, or as your eyes move across the page, your mind moves across the universe? If you read out loud, you'll trap your mind in the moment. The retention is so much better if I read out loud. It's slower, but it's so much more effective. So he's read this book. He says, he, look at me, he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps. <laughs> we don't get too many eager ones. So that's someone responsible. And then we define sponsor. Having had the experience yourself, you're giving much practical advice. What experience? Experience on going through the 12 steps. What advice? Advice on how to go through the 12 steps. There's sponsorship in two sentences. I do not run the lives of the men that I sponsor. My sponsor does not run my life. He runs my recovery program. I run their recovery programs. And I got different programs for different guys. I mean, the guy is 62 years old. He's single and retired. I got a program for him. He's 28, got married, got three kids, and worked two and a half jobs. Got a whole different program for him. So I need to know something about his life. I believe my number one job as a sponsor is to love him. I'm told that God is love. When I give love, I give God. It is the highest gift. My number two job is to coach him through these 12 steps at a pace that makes sense to me based on what I know about his life. And it's all negotiable in the front end. My experience has been when I ask him to do something, I get reasons why he can't on the front end. I get excuses why he didn't on the back end. Reasons, excuses. It's all negotiable on the front end. He calls me and says, he says, I can't work on my four-step this week. Okay, why? Well, my boss is flying in tonight. We're starting with breakfast at 6.30 in the morning, running through way past dinner tomorrow night, five days in a row. I couldn't agree more. You can't work on your four-step this week. Great. Call and tell me why you can't. Don't call and tell me why you didn't. Whatever his first reason is he can't, I'm taking it because that's what he needs. There's only one question when I'm dealing with him. There's only ever one. It's what does he need? That's the only question there will ever be on that, I think. And what he needs is for me to buy that the first couple of times, even if I think it's a little bit shabby because that's what he needs. Now, if he keeps that up, we're going to talk about it. But I'm going to take him through this work. If he can convince me, and several have, probably more have than not, that he's not going to allow me to coach him through these 12 steps. Job one remains to love him. Job two changes. Job two becomes to make it easy for him to come back. Because you see, if he doesn't do these 12 steps, he's not staying. If he doesn't get a spiritual awakening at the result, he's going to get thirsty again. When he gets thirsty, he's going to drink. And my job is to make it easy for him to come back. And the first piece of that is to make sure he knows he was never here. I'm sober about four years, and I call Mike, sponsor number four, and I say, rah, 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 this guy I'm sponsoring, what should I do? And he says, drop him. And I said, come on, Mike, I'm being serious. This is one of the most spiritual men I will ever know. I said, I'm being serious. And he said, I'd rather have you on the golf course that working with him be better for your spiritual program. Well, Mike has never heard me play golf. Um, but I said, I don't get it. I don't get it. And he said, what are you asking him to do that he's not doing? And I said, well... Go to a meeting every day, call me every day, start his fourth step, call his parole officer, look for a job, and follow the directions of the book to open and close his days. He said, and how much of that's he doing? I said, he's not doing any of it. He said, you are not his sponsor. He is. You are his fire chief. And when his tail feathers are ablaze, he calls you and siphons off some of your serenity and goes right back to doing it his way. He said, could you stay sober on the program he's working? I said, I don't think so. He said, can he? I said, I don't think so. He said, you are probably right, and you are going to need to be able to sleep when he goes back out. This particular guy's a jailbird. His disease puts him in jail. He's probably going back to jail, and you're going to need to be able to sleep knowing that you told him the truth. And the truth is, you are not his sponsor, and he is not in the program. And I went with a very heavy heart to this guy, because I was surrendered to Mike. And I said, listen, this, the program's the 12 steps, and you're not in them. I, Definition, insanity. Thinking you're in a 12-step program and not actually taking all 12 steps. I would propose if you've not taken all 12 steps, you are not in a 12-step program. You might want to think about getting into one. And I said, you're not, you're not in this program because you haven't done the steps, and you're not allowing me to sponsor you because you're not doing what I ask. And I can't continue to co-sign the lie. And I'm hoping he's going to say, no, please, I'll do anything. I say, well, the definition of anything hasn't changed, but I'll give it to you again. This is the way we have to do it. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes they don't know they're not doing it. I have to tell them. I don't want him to be able to sit on bar stools and believe that he tried AA and it didn't work for him. I signed his death warrant 
if I don't tell him he wasn't here. The book says that, by the way, in two places, not the death warrant, but it says twice to drop somebody that won't work with you. And I think it's really important to do that so he can come back. He has to know that he was not here. But anyway, I, uh, Mike said, uh, he said, how do you feel when you work with this guy? And I said, I've, <laughs> what I said, I said, I feel like they pulled the corks out of my heels and the blood ran out. He said, how do you feel when you work with Bill Kay? I said, oh, he lights me up like Chinese New Year's. Really? What are you asking Bill to do that he's not doing? I said, he's doing it all. He said, uh-huh. Sponsorship is a two-way street, and Bill's holding up his end, and you are getting this wonderful feeling working with him. Because you can tell, if sponsorship, if it's not working for one of you, it's not working for either one. And, and not every time. I don't expect to be elated every time I talk to a sponsee, but it should light me up most of the time. If it's not, we need to look at it because it's probably not working for either one of us. And the kind thing to do, I believe there's a principle. And the principle is that if something is right in a given situation for one person involved, it's right for everyone involved. It was right for me to quit funding the party for my daughter. It was right for her for me to quit funding the party for her. Uh, she and I had this conversation a couple of days ago. I said, I use you for, an, for a, an example and told her that. She said, yeah, that's exactly right. If she didn't like it at the time. doesn't mean it wasn't right for her. Um, so, uh, so I dropped him, and the next time I saw him was a couple of days later, and he bounced off of both door jams coming into the meeting, and his eyes were glassy, and the only time I've ever seen it, he was arrested out of the meeting. The uniformed police officers came in and arrested him out of the meeting. We shared a, a, a parking lot with a grocery store, and he left his car parked up against somebody else's, and they came in, and that's the last time I saw him, and I did not throw away his chance of recovery. He did. I gave him a chance to come back. And as hard as that is, I, I worked, uh, old train wreck had one not too long ago. And he said, man, it's breaking my heart. I said, it darn well better. What's wrong with you if it doesn't? That still is the right thing to do. I cannot afford to allow the price of allowing how I feel to affect what I do. It is not what I think, feel, believe, or interpret that keeps me in sobriety. It is singularly what I do. And I don't have to feel like doing it. I have to do it. And, and I think that's, that's just so important. I, uh, I love it. I just love it when a new guy I'm sponsoring tells me he lied to me. Oh, gee. Page 23. Dead center of the page. Paragraph begins. Once in a while he may tell the truth. Once in a while, maybe. All right, there it is. There it is. I knew he was going to lie to me the day before I met him. He's an alcoholic. That's what they do. He can't, his lies don't hurt me. He calls me and he says, man, I told you I went to seven meetings last week and I only went to six. And I say, wow, I'm so excited for you. I celebrate your recovery. Look how far you've come. You used to lie for credit when you could have got cash for the truth. You just lied all the time. And here this little bitty thing about one meeting is eating on your soul to the point where you can't stand it. And you've had to call me. I celebrate you. Wow, look how far you've come. In the first place, that's true. In the second place, I think one of the principles of sponsorship is I need to cheer for him every time I get a chance. It has to be real. But I have to cheer for him every time I get a chance. And boy, that's a chance because that's the truth. And how hard it must have been for him to pick up the phone and call me because I have a reputation as a very hard-nosed sponsor. And I'm not. I mean, as long as I'm getting my own way. I, I'm <laughs> really a piece of cake. And, uh, and he has no idea what I'm going to do. So two things. One is that's the truth. I celebrate. Look how far he has come. The second piece is never again when he think, well, I don't need to call Scott. I know what he's going to say because he didn't know I was going to say that. I always celebrate it when he tells me he's lied to me. It's always a cause for celebration. Um, I don't make the choices for the men that I sponsor. Uh, because I talked about a mistake as an invitation to the lesson. I don't know what his lesson is. Um, I've used him, for example, before, but uh, my sponsee was crosswise with this producer again, and he called me one day, rawr, 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 and uh, I said, what do you think your options are? And he says, well, I guess I could honk her down and keep taking it. I said, yeah, that's an option. What else? Well, I guess I could go back in there and tell her off and quit. I said, sure, that's an option. What else? He said, that's all I can think of. I said, well, I can think of a couple of more. I think my job as a sponsor is to help him explore options. I said, you could get a 12-gauge and blow her head off. He said, well, that's not a good idea. It was funny. A couple of months later, he called me. He says, he says you're going to laugh. 
I was in a, another argument with that producer, and I thought I ought to just kill her. And then he started laughing. He said, no, no, we talked about that. That's no good. So let's talk about it and discard it. Uh, commit suicide, jump out the window. What floor are you on? He said, second floor. Said, That's no good. It's just a broken ankle. Um, how about go back in there and say, I'm really sorry we got crosswise, and I think I may be out of bounds. Talk to me. Or go back in there and say, I'm not sure I understood everything that went on in this last meeting. Would you play some of it back? Or go to one or more of the people who were in that meeting and ask them what happened. Or send one or more of those people an email and ask them what happened and are you out of bounds. Just lay out a whole bunch of options that he didn't see. And then he chooses. I don't choose. And as long as he chooses one that's not out, if he chooses the 12 gauge, we're going to have to talk. But as long as he chooses one that's not out of bounds spiritually, I can't have any more input. Because I don't know what his lesson is. I don't know. And I found an exception on that about two years ago. One of the guys I sponsor has got over 20. His wife went back out. And she's on prescription meds. And uh, she's getting them on the street. And, uh, and he said some friends were saying we need to do an intervention on her and I don't know what to do. And I said, you must do the intervention. I step in. And the reason is that your children are riding in a car with a woman who's impaired. And I am not going to stand beside you over one of your children's caskets saying, damn, I wish I'd told you to do the intervention on her. I'm not going to do that to us. When it's life or death, I will step in and make the choice. It's the only exception I've found, and it's the only time I've had to use it. Um, oh, I like the temporary sponsor idea. I have given probably run about 100 a year that I give a temporary sponsor to. Somebody new shows up at my home group, meet them at the door, and say, hi, I don't recognize you, you've been here before, how long are you sober? You probably don't have a sponsor yet. No, I don't. Well, you're probably going to want a temporary sponsor. While you look around, you have someone to kind of get you started, you know you're going to change, he knows you're going to change, it's no big deal. It's something he can say yes to. We tell him to get a sponsor. In the first place, he doesn't know what a sponsor does. What does he do? What if I get the wrong one? Can I change? If I can change, how do I change? Got all of this stuff rattling around his head. Take that all off the table with a temporary sponsor. And I walk him up to someone that I know has done these 12 steps and say, can you be his temporary sponsor? I mean, you know he's going to change. He knows he's going to change. But he needs someone to kind of get him started while he looks for a, a full-time sponsor. Will you take that assignment? So, oh, yeah, I'll be happy to do it. Let's exchange phone numbers. That's another one. I don't let the men I sponsor give their phone numbers to new men. It's a waste of time. The new guy can't call you. Exchange phone numbers with him and call him twice in the next three days. I require that of myself and the men I sponsor. Let's make them welcome. And uh, give them a temporary sponsor. Yeah, I'm your temporary sponsor. Here's your first assignment. I know a guy has been another guy's temporary sponsor for 22 years. <laughs> now, I know people say, well, do you want temporary sobriety? Well, okay, if that's how you have to do it, then go ahead. But I want to say something to the newcomer. Can, and I do it with the women, too. If I see a new woman, I walk her right up, say, temporary sponsor, walk her over to a woman I know, and get out of there. I also tell her, by the way, any guy that tries to help you is way too sick to be any help at all. I'm done. I am out of here. And, uh, and what to do with guys that are, uh, are abusing new women in recovery? And I'll, t I'll tell you what I've done a couple of times. We had that many years ago at the original back room. And uh, three of us, three guys, we just decided to stop it. And every time he'd walk up to a new woman, we'd go with him. And as soon as he'd take a breath, we'd say to her, you know, any guy that approaches you in a meeting as new as you are is way too sick to be any help at all. You don't want to hang around sick guys like him and me. You want to be with these ladies. Come with me. And you only do that a couple of times, and he quits coming to your group. He's probably still doing it, but he's not doing it in my group. And uh, I think it's really important to get that stopped. That's really important. I didn't know we were going there. Um, The Buddhists have a wonderful saying. They say the only way to get into heaven is to bring someone with you. Isn't that what sponsorship is about? Isn't that exactly what we're talking about? John? You know, I, uh, I thought when I got here I needed a sponsor who was going to kick my ass. You know, and, and what, what I was really saying is I need somebody to motivate me. <laughs> I need someone to give me some willingness. And that's really the last thing I need. I, I've kind of fell asleep while Scott was talking, so I'm not sure if he talked about this, but, you know, I, I, you know, I think there's really five, probably more, but, you know, there's five main characteristics I can think of of a good sponsor. He's a sober member of the same sex. For me, I, I can't sponsor 
Barbie very effectively. You know, the, the, the idea is to take sex out of the equation. I mean, I'd really like to hear her fifth step, but it's probably not good for her, if you know what I'm saying. I, now, if sometimes if people are gay, that changes. I, I sponsored a, a female for about a dozen years with my sponsor's permission and with my wife's permission. I really did not want to do it. But, it, it, you know, she's still sober and I'm still sober, so it must have worked. So one is a sober member of the same sex. The other is that they've taken the 12 steps out of this book. Right? I, I, you know, I, I need a guy that is farther down the path. We talked about that. And he's in service. You know, it's been my experience that um, people who are not out carrying the message have not received it yet. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as simple as that. Now, it doesn't mean we all don't go through rough spots and, and so forth, but, you know, either your life has been transformed and you understand why it was transformed. You know, God did not get me sober to give me a mansion or Mercedes. If anything that I've ever received from this program has solely been to show the next guy how to find the same peace and love and mercy. He needs to be enjoying life. I, I, you know, I don't want some cranky old guy who's been sober 400 years if he hasn't helped anybody and hasn't worked the steps and, you know, forever. We call those used to bees. Every time, I mean, I'm sure anyone who's taken a meeting somewhere, you know, is, um, you're, you're talking about service. Somebody will come up afterwards and say, you know, I used to, I used to go to meet. I used to take meetings in the prison. It was great. I used to. I used to sponsor a bunch of guys. I used to, I used to, I used to. And my friend Tanya says, you know, used to bees don't make no honey, right? Like, I don't need, like, there, there are some guys that are more qualified to sponsor me with 40 months than with 40 years. You know, there's some guys with 40 years that I wouldn't ask directions to 7-Eleven. And so he needs to be enjoying life because he, you know, it's just the way it is. I, I got to have a guy that has what I want or I'm not going to follow him, you know. And, and my sponsor does not, even before Scott was my sponsor, you know, I never worked well with a sponsor who, you know, gave me instructions or, you know, the, for me, I need to bring to the relationship that his suggestions are orders, but that's my attitude. Like, I need to take that mm -hmm. attitude that, hey, look, I'm just going to do what this guy tells me to do because he knows more, you know. It's like, you know, you don't, you don't go to the gym and hire a trainer and he says, listen, these are the five upper body exercises we need to fix your shoulder. And I go, well, yeah, those two sound good. <laughs> those three are a lot of effort, you know. And so I have to surrender to this process that, that this guy is going to, I'm going to take his instruction when it comes to recovery. Another reason why I don't sponsor women as, you know, as a general rule of thumb is there was a study done, and, and women use about 14,000 words a day, and men use 9,000, right? And so at the end of my day, I've got a few words for my guys, right? But if I get home and a woman wants to talk to me, she's got 5,000 words left. I've got none. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be of service. You know, I really agree with what Scott says. Like I, I, our job as sponsors is not to decide, go take this job, leave her. That's not my business. I, I have no yeah. idea on those decisions, right? And the book, and the book says the same thing. Um, and, and when I could get to that point that I talked about earlier of, of surrendering this need to be right and surrendering this need to be powerful, I don't, you know, so many of the younger guys I sponsor who are sponsoring guys, because I only sponsor guys if they're going to sponsor other guys. We make that deal at the beginning. At some point, you're going to start sponsoring. If you're not willing to do that, I can't help you. Um, but one of the you know, early complaints we all have had, right? God, I told, him to, I told him to call me every day, and he never does. I told him to read, and he never does. You know, I told him to do A, B, C, and D, and he never does, right? He's got a need to be powerful. His ego's attached to it, right? He's got a need to be effective. You ever go uh, take a meeting into a, a treatment center that say the room is this big, and there's only seven people? And they're all sitting against the back wall, and it's like an impossible to talk to them. And you're just guy like, oh, this is the worst talk ever. Well, that, that feeling is created by a need to be effective. And it's, it's okay to have it. You just got to recognize it for what it is. And I got to I surrender that. And you know, that's God's business. My job is to show up and carry whatever message I have. I used to, you know, when I get asked to run my mouth a little bit, you know, think I had to, and I still struggle with it sometimes, but I think I have to think of something brilliant to say. Oh, they've asked me to speak about. The third step, let me study and, you know, what is so-and-so, you know, and, and that's not it, right? God, God, and I believe that God has sent us there for our message, right? We have a unique experience. If we had the, all had the same experience, it wouldn't be very useful, right? Each one of us has a, a different message that we need to hear. You know, and that, and that I, I can't nag a guy to do stuff, right? I'm just, you can take it or leave it. This is, you know, and the book talks about this, and on the bottom of 95, it says, on the bottom of 95, it says, if he thinks he can do the job in some other way, 
or prefer some other spiritual approach, encourage him. I'm not selling this. My, my old sponsor, this guy, Jimmy J, I love to death, he told me this little story about how he learned this lesson. He had his older brother was one of us and could not stay sober, would not stay sober, and Jimmy always just nagged him, come on, let's go to a meeting, you know, because his life had gotten so much better. Come on, let's go, come on, let's, you know, let's get sober, let's do it, you know. And um, his brother was in the hospital again for some liver problems from drinking, and, and, and Jimmy was walking down the hall, and he could hear his brother talking to his other brothers. You know, and he's like, oh, I'm really grateful you guys are here. And stuff. He goes, but he goes, don't let Jimmy in. Jimmy's just going to nag my ass about getting sober. You know, his brother died drunk. You know, he just refused to hear the message, you know. I mean, we've got to get to that point where we're ready to ask for it. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't push, nag, or even try to convince. You know, I don't, it's not my job to sell you on the, on your, that you're an alcoholic and that you need this solution. It says it right in this, the, the um, paragraph above this, we talked about the first step process of giving a guy a book and telling him to find himself. It's right here in 95. If he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. Now, if he's not sure, if he's in the right place, I'll, I'll help him diagnose that. I'll share with him how I found myself in the book. That's, that's why we, we need to, to understand what's in the book. You put, in, put me in mind, uh, my, uh, my sponsee from Ukraine is just a dynamo. I, it, it's a shame this isn't multi-level marketing. I would be a bazillionaire down that <laughs> leg. He's sobering up, sobering up the entire Soviet Union. He's, he's every sponsor's favorite problem. I haven't to hold him back. He's doing too much. That's every sponsor's favorite problem. <laughs> we don't lose many of those. And uh, Scott just likes them because they make him look good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's his job. And uh, he, uh, he called me one day and I, he said, listen, I got a question. I, I got this one sponsee and I, I've taken him all the way through the steps and he refuses to sponsor anyone. What should I do? I said, drop him. And he said, no, no, I'm serious. I love this guy, and he's just been, you know, I really, I said, oh, look, let me explain it to you another way. If you don't drop him, I'm dropping you. And he said, whoa. And I said, I don't work with guys that don't do what I ask. It's a negotiable on the front end. But if he won't sponsor, we can't afford for you to have a dead end. You've got way too much message for way too many people. You get enough of those, and you're done. And we can't afford that. And besides that, if he's not out giving this away, he's probably not going to make it anyway. It's absolutely critical that he be out there on the firing line. And uh, Ole explained it to that lad, and today he's sponsoring six, and they're sponsoring 60, and I don't know how far that goes. That's a long time ago. But it is so, so critically important to get out there and do it. There's nothing else to do, folks. There's, you know, there's, there's, um, there's questions probably in there. There's, every time we've done this, one of the questions is, you know, how, how many people should you sponsor? What's the most amount of people you can sponsor? And the answer to that question is, well, whatever your sponsor tells you, that's how many people you can sponsor. Uh, you know, I, I believe for me there's uh, there's a, a limit to the amount of people that I can effectively sponsor. You know, and for me the litmus test is if I take on someone else to sponsor, is it going to take away from those men that I are currently sponsor and my family? Um, and one time I, you know, I just got a, this guy asked me to sponsor him, and I this is one of these moments where the you know, the truth just fell out of Scott's mouth by accident. It didn't know he was coming. I called, I said, you know, I just don't know if I have the time. And, and Scott said, well, a ask your wife and kids, see if they think you have time, you know. And ask your sponsees. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, he's talking about uh, Oleg, our friend in the Ukraine. I, I had the opportunity to go over there this summer to, to Moscow and to Siberia. And w Scott's not kidding. These guys are, uh, there's one guy who was our host for a day. His name was Andre. He drove us around all day, and, and every moment we were in the car, he was just screaming on the phone at somebody. And at the end of the day, I said, "What? Well, you know, is there like a crisis? Uh, you know, are we is there a fire? What's going on?" He goes, "Oh no, no, I just I sponsor a lot of guys." And and um, I said, "How many guys do you sponsor?" He said, "35, 35 guys." You know, because it's, it's so new over there. You know, uh, it's just it's just incredible. So I mean, I certainly couldn't sponsor that many guys, but. You know, it depends on your your life situation. Are you 62 and retired and nothing to do, or 28 and 18 kids? Yeah, I agree with whatever your sponsor says. Yeah. And that's the answer to all the questions in this basket, by the way. Uh, we agree with whatever your sponsor says. I think we'll go ahead and take a few of these. Now, get that over here so I can read them first. This is for you. 
I want to do service work in jails or treatment centers, rehabs, but I don't feel like I fit in there because I wasn't a part of that wasn't a part of my story. Give you a softball. Yeah, that's a that's a soft one right over the plate. I was sober a little under a year, and Jerry said to me, you're finished in public information forever. You are a promoter, and we don't do that. You will now take a meeting into the jail. I said, Jerry, I've never even been arrested. He said, I have a newsflash for you, Sparky. The boys in jail already know how to get arrested. They're not going to need your help with that. <laughs> Rarely we've seen a person in jail who has thoroughly followed our path. You can show them how to not come back to jail, not get down there. And... Uh, Boy, I did. And I've been doing corrections for 34 years, and I wouldn't take anything for it. And, and that, that's, you don't need that. What you've got is a way for them to not come back. I took a meeting at the jail one time with a fellow that I sponsored, and he said, uh, can I chair it? And I said, sure. There's about 30 inmates sitting around. And uh, he says, before we start, I ask a question. Who here has been car incarcerated at least one other hand, one other time? All the hands went up. He said, okay, one, other, one more question. Just count the last time you were inside. Who have promised yourself no matter what, no matter what you got to do, no matter what you got to not do, no matter who it affects, no matter what, you're never coming back to jail. All the hands went up again. He said, gentlemen, we've just proved that that won't work. We're here to talk about something that will. They got real quiet after that. Ready for the next this one? This one's for me too, right? It is. After doing the first half of the fifth step, actively listening, do you give the sponsee a list of objectionable behaviors to take to God in six and seven after he finishes the hour reviewing the five proposals? No. That was an easy one. <laughs> no, I don't do that. Is suicidal ideation always a surrender moment? I can't really understand the second half of this, but what do you tell a guy that's suicidal? Uh, my experience with it has been I ask questions. The first question is, have you been spending spend a lot of time thinking about yourself? The answer is always yes. The second question is, have you been staying in today? And the answer is always no. So let's go to work first on thinking about others. And second, let's get this today word cranking here and let's see what happens. Because when I was suicidal and those that I've talked to have been, you know, I, mean, I told you my daughter shot herself. It, it is her great pleasure to talk to people who have been suicide or close to it and talk about those two things. That you're thinking about yourself all the time and you are not staying in today because that's where that happens. Do you, I'll answer this one, you calm down. Do you believe it's okay as long as someone knows everything about you, your secrets, or do you think your sponsor needs to know everything? I love that question because that was kind of my MO the first few years in here. I would share, you know, I, I, I believe what they told me that, you know, your only secret is your secrets, you can't have any secrets, you can't have any secrets. And so I would share about 80% of my story with everybody. I would cover all the bases, you know, 80 with Ben, 80 with Glenn, 80 with Scott, and in that, all 100 would get covered, right? But as the, the instructions in the FISIP says, someone else needs to know all your life story. And so the answer is yes, my sponsor must know everything. There's, there's just something that happens when, when one person knows every single thing about me. Because I'm, and if I'm, and if I'm holding back something, I'm still in management. I'm still, I'm still in control of my own recovery. I think one of the reasons that we exchange fist steps is I want him to know mine. Uh, I got a call from this Bill Kay you've heard me talk about one time, and he had a sponsee who'd been involved in abortion and needed to write the letter, and he didn't have that experience and knew who to call me. And we, that was before I'd gone public with this, and we were able to sit down and do it together. Uh, I've got a very close personal friend who was a male prostitute. I never did that. I don't judge him on that. I would have been fully capable of doing that myself. Every once in a while, I run into a guy who's got that, and it's killing him. I know where to take him. That's what those things are for. Who are some of your favorite AA speakers, past and present? You, you must not have been listening at all this weekend <laughs> if you haven't heard Scott mention uh, 12 different speakers. What was your best aha moment? Go ahead. I, I want to hear yours. <laughs> I didn't sleep the first three nights I was in treatment. I'm laying there the fourth night knowing I'm not going to sleep again. And I began to see my life like you might see a series of short movies. And uh, I got to the place where I began to think about the worst thing I'd ever done. I told you it, it was the abortion. I'd always been able to stop it before. Jose can stop that for me. Jack knows how to stop that. I'm laying in a bed in a treatment center. I can't get it stopped. I've got this horrible thing all over me, and I can't get anything between me and what I've done. 
and I reached what I was going to call bottom until John changed the definition for me a couple of years ago. And I got to the place where I'd have paid any price and done anything to get out from under that guilt. And from in here, in my chest, this didn't happen in my mind, my voice, my vo mouth didn't move, my vocal cords don't move. From in here screamed, and it was internal, and it was spiritual, and it was loud to a God I don't think I believed in. God forgive me. And the very next moment, everything I'm about to tell you happened. There was suddenly a magnificent white light shining just on me and on my bed, and the light had a warmth and a texture. And I could feel the light in every cell of my body, and I was aware of every cell of my body at the same moment. And it felt so good it almost hurt. I cannot explain that to you. At the same moment, something very heavy, I'm laying on my back, at the same moment, something very heavy is laying all over me, flew off of me, and my body felt so light, I thought I was going to float off the bed, and it did not scare me. There was a, a white partition about a foot behind my head, came within about a foot of the ceiling, and the light was coming over the top, but it was all focused just on me. There were also several, I remember a yellow and I think a Kelly green, looked like pieces of glass colored about the size of my hand, but random shapes here and there. And the light was coming through there and all focused on me at that same moment. And uh, I used to say God forgave me in that moment, but I don't speak for God. And I'm not comfortable around people that do. I know that I received his forgiveness in that moment. I don't know that he ever judged me. But I know I received his forgiveness in that moment. And I lay there in the presence of infinite love. And with my eyes closed, I could see that room in better detail than I can see this one now. And I lay there in the presence of infinite love for a while. And what we call time does not exist in that presence. Two-tenths of a second and three months are the exact same number there. Cannot explain that to you. And, and after that, I must have slept. at. Some, I don't, I'm not aware of anything else that passed between us that night. I'm not saying it did or didn't. I do not know. But I must have slept because I awakened the next morning. I hadn't done that in several days. A moment, it was that moment when I screamed for forgiveness and got it. And I lay in the presence of infinite love. And I love to tell the story because I get to relive it, not at that level, but at some level. Thanks for asking. Oh, and a lot of people feel like they've been robbed because they didn't get one of those. This is page 12 in Bill's story, but soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly those within myself. I don't believe that item would have gotten me a 35-year chip. And uh, I'm running a stopwatch on us. And uh, the, last, the last person I talked to that had one of these drank again after his. I've talked to seven or eight this year. I'm running a stopwatch on I don't know where we are. That, that have had that that drank again. So that's not the key. It was just a cornerstone. It's just a beginning. It is this process we go through that's where the magic is. I've, I've had a number of, of those big, and I'm sure everyone in here has the big aha moments where we you know, realize something and a different gift shows up for us. And I've never had a white light experience. Um, for me, it was that, that voice I heard that day that was, if everything's God's, she can't steal from you. And that, you know, um, there's been a couple uh, like that where you just, you hear an absolute truth that just sings to your soul that you just you can't ignore. You know, I mean, you say around here any period of time those those start happening to you. I love this question. I, I've got another one. I was sober three or four years, and after a meeting, this wonderful young lady said to me, "What's the difference between hope and expectations?" And I didn't know to open my mouth, and this fell out. Expectations are specific; they come from my mind. And they're actually premeditated resentments because if I don't get them, I'm going to be angry. Hope is general. It comes from my spirit. It's based on the great truth that a loving God holds my future. And I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I love this question because it, it, there's so many times I've, I've, my sponsor has told me something to do and I call the next day and say, what was that that I was, you know, can we talk about this again? And, and the courage it takes to ask this again. Remind us of the simple words to say for an amends. You talked about, if I've made four breaths, I've talked too long. I wasn't as good a friend to you as I could have been, and I have disrespected you. And I'm living a different life now, and I know I've done some damage here, and I would like to repair it. Can you tell me how? Do you need to tell me how I've hurt you? 
That's plenty. Huh? Oh, you got to buy the tapes. Okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, you, you old guys, tapes, they've been CDs for 20 years, you uh, know. Yeah. Ben still doesn't know. This, this one is for you, Scott. You um, just can't remember. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to censor this a little bit, take some liberties because of the language involved. Uh, how will I ever lose my road rage? I, 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 think, I think the answer to that is, is in meditation. It's what I said before. Is is to sit quietly in God's. So the first piece is to go through this twi this fourth step, and get that anger out, get those old resentments out. You've got, most of us have a pool of old anger, and somebody does something not very big, and we blow up about it. You've seen it. You've probably done it yourself, and it's because the reaction was way beyond what was actually warranted from the event, and it's because of that pool of old anger. And the better job I do of staying cleaned out of those resentments, the harder it is for me to get upset. I just don't tend to get upset. Um, sometimes in traffic, I just caught my fifth traffic light in a row, stoplight in a row. And I can stop and say, wow, God, thanks that I, I got that last traffic light. Who am I to say that that traffic light isn't the one that kept me from having the wreck with a gasoline truck? See, I don't know. I don't know. And we're going to embrace that not knowing it can get real peaceful for me. But the first piece is to get dug out, get that poison dug out through step four and nine. And the next piece is to get into meditation and stay there. Your perspective on sponsoring people whose primary problem is not alcohol, drug addiction, in parentheses. I um I think it's our job to help other people find where they belong. I I um you know very rarely do I I meet a guy that's a drug addict that's not an alcoholic, but it does happen. And um, mm -hmm. I've made the mistake. I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I've made the mistake of early on because I wanted to sponsor this guy so bad. Um, you know my ego was attached to it a little bit. I said, well let's just you know, we'll go through with this and let's just replace the words in the big book. You know when it says alcohol, just use drugs. And I thought that was a pretty smart thing to do. I'd heard that before. I didn't come up with my own. And, and what I, 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 I later realized and uh, felt terrible about was that I, I was robbing him of our greatest hook in here. And that's that identifying in, that, that hearing another person's story, knowing that I'm in the right place. And so I try, when I, when I believe someone belongs to another fellowship, I, I try to hook them up with someone in that fellowship and try to help them make their, their program better. You know, so I, I don't know if, if you end up. There was an interesting word in that question, and the question was his primary. Yeah. I don't care what his primary is. I don't care what his drug of choice is. My drug of choice is whatever you had the most of. Right? Yeah. I'm a pig. I'm what they call tri-addicted. I'm addicted to everything I tried. <laughs> right? it, and, but, yeah, and so the question is, are you an alcoholic, yes or no? Right. Did you ever quit forever and not stay quit? Did you ever get drunk by accident? Yes or no? Because I don't, I don't care what your drug of choice is. I, I have no interest in that. If you're an alcoholic, welcome to AA. And I don't, my primary was marijuana. That was what brought me to my knees. I've been an alcoholic since the first time I got the second beer when I was 18. And I was only on drugs for about the last four years. And when I was in treatment, they told me I needed to go to NA because marijuana was my drug of choice. Fortunately enough, I went to AA also, and AA seemed to fit me better. And I'm not saying anything negative about NA. You can't get me to do it. I won't. They're doing some wonderful work over there. But it didn't fit me. So I tell people, go to all of the fellowship that you qualify in. Right. Go to a lot of meetings in all of the fellowships you qualify in while you shop around and see where you seem to fit the best. That's my recommendation. Now, if somebody is not an alcoholic, I'm willing to take him through the steps, but he needs to go to meetings somewhere else. I'll take anybody through the steps. I, I don't mind at all. We used to do something in Nashville we called the Bill Wilson Literary Society. We'd get a group of guys together, we'd go through, and we would do the big book. If it said they observed something, we'd try to observe it. If it said they wrote something, we'd write it. If it said they prayed something, we'd prayed it. And we did the big book together. We'd typically start with 20 and finish with about 8. But those eight today either died sober or are still sober. And I've done that several times. 
and I talked to Pritz about it one time. I said, what do you think about this? He said, I think it's wonderful. But he said, don't limit it to alcoholics. He said, get anybody that will come to that and show them how to use these steps so they can take it back to their fellowship and make their fellowship stronger, and they won't need to come to ours. Pretty good piece of information. I don't talk about drugs. and I, Actually, I do. If you've heard my story, I mentioned the pool room where I bought my dope and drank my beer. Bill mentions it once in his story. I think that's a pretty good precedent. I mentioned it once. But I don't care what your drug of choice is. I, I'd have to work hard for a month to care any less about that. Can you define spiritual arrogance? Describe some of its subtle manifestations and talk about how to recognize and be rid of it. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can. Guilty as charged, Your Honor. When I think I have the answers, when I think I know what somebody else needs to do, I'm in real trouble. And, and when I think my program is better than somebody else's, when I think I know more about this book than somebody else, when I think the approach they're doing is wrong, when I think my religion is the best one and if you're not in it, you're a fool, that's all spiritual arrogance, spiritual pride. Dangerous, dangerous stuff for a guy like me. I continue to, have, I continue to hear about this second surrender. Being someone who is trying to avoid pain, <laughs> how do I avoid this pain? How can I be proactive? I'm over six years sober and, and, and feel connected. Is it commonplace to have a second surrender? Uh, it's been my experience. It doesn't have to be everyone's experience. Um, it, uh, it's been an observation of mine that people who get sober very young tend to have a second surrender. Um, it was impossible to convince this alcoholic at 18 years old that I needed a spiritual awakening. Um, I had to be convinced of that kind of later down the road. I, I think some of the lessons that we learn in life are not just about chronological ages, uh, length of sobriety, but it's also about you know our, our lifespan and the age that we are. And, um, so it doesn't certainly have to happen. I mean, we know many people who are sober a long time. And, um, but, I, you know, I'm going to kind of double speak here a little bit because that's my strong suit, is um, I hope I have 100 surrenders. Mm -hmm. You know, I just hope I don't have to hurt anybody else in that process. You know, um, I want to surrender everything. I don't want to be attached to anything. No, I'm not very good at that, but that's the goal. Yeah, I like it. It's... It, some people will change what they're doing with mild discomfort. I prefer a thorough thrashing. I would rather just be ground into the pavement <laughs> before I'm ready. And I, I, think, I think if there's anything I can work on, it's my willingness to do it somebody else's way. I, 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 uh, I picked up my 26-year chip in Key West a number of years ago where I don't know anybody. I said, how'd you do it? And I told him the truth, somebody else's way. <laughs> Mine didn't work. I need to remember that need to remember that. As far as the second surrender, you know, if you're doing fine today, stay with it. Don't worry about it. You're, it sounds like you're off in the future trying to fix something, trying to keep from having the pain that's going to take you to surrender. Get out of that future. It's a bad spot. Come on back here with us. You're doing fine today. Congratulations. That's the best any of us will do. You both mentioned being unfaithful during your recovery. Did you fess up to this or get caught? Did you work through, how did you work through this after the fact? Uh, I can answer for both of us, but I don't stop anything because it's a bad idea. I stop because I get caught, um, mm -hmm. and that was the case with Scott. And I'll tell you, we, um, my wife and I were able to work through this with uh, the power of Alcoholics Anonymous and a bunch of professionals. Um, as I told you, when this happened in our life, I mean, every... Every weekend, our kids got scooped up by somebody, you know, that she sponsored, or I sponsored, and they should just, you know, you guys just spend time with each other. And, you know, my wife dragged me around. Well, that's not true. We 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 went to a number of. Um, we're not recording this, are we? I didn't say that. Uh, we went to a number of therapists and counselors, and you know, because I I desperately really wanted to know, you know, what in the hell was wrong with John? Like, wh why would I do this? You know, at this point in my life, and, and at the end of the day, the discovery was. I mean, we went to a lot, maybe eight different therapists and counselors, and at the end of the day, I found out that I had this really bad case of untreated alcoholism. Um, it could have saved about $10,000. Um, I really believe that. I mean, if I, if I had blown my brains out that night, the death certificate should have read untreated alcoholism. Um, but I, I, we, I got a gift in all of that, and the best advice, you know, this is the last question, how did you work through this after the fact? 
yeah, it took a long time for uh, a long time, you know. But we're we're in a better place than we ever were, and my wife won't tell you that uh, she's grateful that it happened, um, but she she'll tell you that she's grateful for the man I am today, that Alcoholics Anonymous has made me. And um, you know, the best advice I got out of all of that was from a, this professional, and he said, you know, in trying to recover from from an affair, um, he told us he said just just do everything together. Just do everything together. He said, John, she wants to, Sunday, it's 1.30, the Redskins are on, and she needs to go to Walmart, hop in the car, and go with her. Because you are not, everything you say for a long time, she might not say it, but everything you say for a long time is going to be a lie. Doesn't matter what it is. It's Sunday, she's going to think it's Monday. And so when you tell her that you're sorry or that you, you, you can't convince her with your words that you want to you make this work, that you want her. She needs to know that you want her. And the only way you can do that is by showing up. Like Scott says, you, you can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. And, you know, we spent every waking moment together for two, three years, and, and it was a fabulous healing process. Linda and I have never been closer than we are right now. She'll tell you that. Get, get one of her recent talks, because she talks about it, too. The forgiveness had to happen for her. It had to happen for me, too. I had to forgive myself for having done that. It's a pretty tough little place, you know. Somebody always pays for a mistake, and I think the most expensive lessons are the ones that are paid for in the currency of somebody else's pain. Those are the expensive ones. And uh, what happened was she used to call me occasionally while we were divorced and just chat. And she called me one day. I was in Florida, and, uh, and we chatted for a while, and she had felt so good. So the next night I called her, and she said, you know, I can't do it. It's just too hard. I just can't talk to you tonight. And I hung up. And I said, okay, God, I think I finally got it. I'm the one that tore this up. This is my mistake. It's my fault. I can't ask to have her back. But if there's something I can do that will help her heal, if you'll tell me what it is, I'll do it. And I think that was where I was finally able to let go of it. And then, then we did get back together. I don't think I need to do the detail on that. But I had to turn it over. You know, what is it we turn over? We turn over the result. When I moved out of the home my first wife and I were living in, so over six years, I moved out because I was going to hit her. Because when I, was, when I was a drunk, I was guilty. She used to control me with my guilt. Drug of choice was control, right? And, and I went through these steps. I got my innocence back. She couldn't control me. It made her crazy. And she used to scream at me. And I just realized one day I'm about to hit her. And I'm, I can't do that. So I had to move out. I didn't know what to do. I said to old timers, what should I do? And they said, turn it over. I said, how? They couldn't tell me. I went to the source. You don't have to believe this came from God. You need to know what I do. And the gift I got was three prayers, and I share them because somebody here needs to hear them. Prayer number one, God, if it's your will for us to be together, put us together. Prayer number two, if it's your will for us, will for us to be apart, put us apart. Those are the easy ones. Here's the big one. God, if it's your will for me not to know today, leave me not knowing. When I can pray that one and mean it, I can have my sponsor's definition of serenity. Serenity isn't freedom from the storm. Serenity is peace in the middle of the storm. The only way I can have that is to give up my need to manage the storm. And the only way I can do that is to know the manager of all storms. And isn't that what we do here? Uh, you got something you want to close with? I got something. Yes. Real quick, I just want to tell you what a great couple of days this has been. Uh, uh, really an incredible amount of participation from you guys. I, you know, a lot of times you do these things and half the people are dragged there by their sponsor don't want to be here. And... And it's your guys' energy that has made this just an incredible weekend for us. Now, I beg you tonight to uh, come back, and, and we're going to be a speaker meeting at 7. Um, Marianne's speaking, and, and just go home and get a newcomer and come back and fill this room with love and energy for her because I know we've been sitting all day, but don't uh, the weekend's not over. Please come back and uh, spread some more joy. The first three words on page 112 are read this book. And I open all the men's retreats that I lead with that, and that's our topic. And just, you've got three minutes. Tell us what page you're on. Read a paragraph or less. Tell us why you read it. We skip all over the book. I did it in one of the state prisons a number of years ago. And I'll tell you, you're taking a meeting into a place like that, try this kind of meeting and see what you get. This is page 456. Easy to remember. Very bottom. I have found that the process of discovering who I really am begins with knowing who I really don't want to be. There are steps 4, 5, and 8, and 9 for you. And then the last paragraph at the bottom of 457. From experience, I've realized that I cannot go back and make a brand new start. But through AA, I can start from now.
and make a brand new end. I love you with all my heart. If you will, let's remain seated and uh, have a few moments of silence to thank God for his presence and we'll slowly whisper the Lord's Prayer with a moment of silence after amen. Let your spirit out of your body and feel the love. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. God bless us all. Safe travel. And thank you all so much, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who made this happen. Yeah, you did.